and welcome to this edition of Constitutionally Sound, a podcast brought to you by the Centre on Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh. I'm Nicola McEwen, a Professor of Territorial Politics and Fellow of the Centre, and for the next half hour or so, we'll be discussing the Conservative Party in Scotland and some of the challenges and perhaps the opportunities the party is facing. Having lost all of its seats in the 1997 election and opposing devolution in the referendum that followed, the Scottish Parliament gave the Scottish Conservatives a platform in which to rebuild itself as a competitive force in Scottish politics. The dominance of the constitutional issue, especially the debate over independence, has elevated the party to second place in the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections, a position it maintained in the election last year. But it still seems a long way from power, unable to win enough votes to govern alone, and unable, so far at least, to be a credible coalition partner. And in Westminster, the Scottish Conservatives have remained clearly aligned with the UK party, at least until now. In January, Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross became one of the first senior Tory figures to call for the Prime Minister Boris Johnson to resign over the parties held in Downing Street against Covid restrictions. In response, some senior figures in the government dismissed the Scottish Tory leader as a lightweight figure. All of this has reignited the debate over whether it's now time for the Scottish party to go it alone. To discuss these issues, I'm delighted to be joined by two guests full of wisdom on the development of the Conservative Party. My colleague, Dr Alan Convery, is Senior Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, having joined the university in 2013. His PhD examined the impact of devolution on the Welsh and Scottish Conservative parties, and in 2016, he published a book on this topic entitled The Territorial Conservative Party, Devolution and Party Change in Scotland and Wales. Andy McKeever is the co-founder of Message Matters, a lobbying and PR consultancy firm. He is a political analyst and strategist and a regular commentator on TV, radio and print news. He's also former head of communications for the Scottish Conservatives, though not a member of the party. Andy describes himself as a federalist who believes the Scottish Parliament will only thrive in a post-constitutional environment with a new set of political parties. Welcome to you both. A pleasure to have your company. Can we begin, first of all, by exploring the longer term relationship between the Scottish and the UK Conservative parties? Alan, you wrote in your book about this and the party's development with the term the Territorial Conservative Party. What is the Territorial Conservative Party? I suppose what I'm referring to in the Territorial Conservative Party is the branches of the the statewide Conservative Party that operate in Scotland and Wales. So in the political science literature, we'd refer to this Conservative Party as a statewide party. It stands candidates across different parts of the UK and it has a branch in Scotland and Wales. When I was doing my research on this, I discovered that the parties in Scotland and Wales actually had quite a lot of autonomy, particularly autonomy over policy issues. So some of the issues we see in other parties that have territorial branches is there's sometimes a lot of pressure exerted from the centre, particularly to try and prevent divergence on policy issues. But through my research when I was doing up to 2016, I found that although the those two branches were merged much more closely with the Conservatives in the UK level than they were pre-65, both branches had pretty much a wide scope in terms of policy autonomy to, to do what they wanted. Andy, you've argued that the party structures need a radical overhaul. I read in a recent article that you'd written, you'd said the only way for Scotland's centre-right to become a credible governing force is for it to form its own party separate from the Westminster Tories. What kind of structure do you have in mind? And is there not quite a lot of autonomy, as Alan was saying already? In theory, yes, there is autonomy. But I think in practice, for two reasons, it's not really relevant. I think reason number one is that depending on who the leader is in Scotland, that autonomy is not always exercised. When I was still working for the party before 2007, um, and I was writing policy and writing manifestos, they were being cleared through London. And some policies, when they were felt to be too distinct from UK-wide policies, were vetoed. Although, in theory, the ability to create their own policy was there, it wasn't actually there in practice. But it might may have been since with other leaders, of course. More importantly, though, I think this is about the perceptions of people when they're in the ballot box. And when you get to the ballot box in a general election, absolutely, 
in a Scottish election almost certainly, and even to a degree in a local election, and you see the word conservative on the ballot paper, you don't think about Douglas Ross or Jackson Carlaw or Ruth Davidson or Annabel Goldie or David McCletchie. In you, in the average voter's head is Boris Johnson or Theresa May or David Cameron or Ian Duncan Smith or Michael Howard. That is the Conservative Party. And I think the theory that you can escape that somehow or get over it by having a good leader here, which they've had lots of, or by kind of creating a bit of grievance or manufacturing a bit of split, and that will make some sort of big difference is is just fanciful. I mean, there's you know there's no evidence that's really ever going to happen. And the difficulty really is that we have a situation in Scotland where, you know, you've quoted one of my articles about the viability of the centre-right actually becoming a government. In the Scottish Parliament, we have proportional representation. So if you want to be a government, you either have to win a majority on your own, which, as we've seen, is supposed to not really happen and, and only happened once when the SNP were incredibly powerful. So the Tories would either have to win a majority by themselves. I don't really think anybody thinks that's credibly going to happen. Or they have to have a coalition partner. And if you don't have the ability to win by yourself and you don't have any friends, then you can't be in government. So effectively what the Tory party is doing is voluntarily locking itself out of government. That's what the centre-right in Scotland is doing. It makes Scotland unique in Europe as really the only country in Europe that cannot have a centre-right government which, you know, I I don't think is particularly healthy. In terms of the system, the short answer to the question is I think we need a Canadian system, whereby uh, the provincial parliaments, uh, as they are in Canada, all have separate parties. The only party with a unified structure in Canada is the New Democrats, the third, what what you would consider to be the third party, the kind of Lib Dems of, of Canada. They have a unified structure whereby at federal level and provincial level, it's a single party. But all the other parties, including the parties that may be called liberal or conservative at provincial level, they may carry the same name in some provinces, but they're actually all completely separate. And in Quebec, which I think is our best example of, uh, you know, our best analogy for what could happen here, you have a series of parties that have absolutely no links and indeed don't even carry the same names as any of the parties in Ottawa. So when you get to an election for the um, National Assembly of Quebec, you're voting for a series of parties with a series of ideologies, all of which are Quebec-only parties. That's what I would do here. You have parties that stand only in Holyrood, and then the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, and the Lib Dems would stand in Scotland at Westminster. That's interesting, and it's easy to see how that might work in the context of Holyrood, but what you're suggesting for Westminster elections would be quite a radical departure from what we have now as well, because it wouldn't be the Scottish Conservative Party as we know it, fielding candidates for that election, it would be the UK party. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, you know, the the Scottish, the the current Scottish Tory MPs would simply be Tory MPs. Their leader would be Boris Johnson. That's what their campaign would be, which in in all seriousness isn't really any different from what it is just now anyway, in my view. And Alan, is that an assessment? that you shared and do you think separating the party changing the structure is a a vote winning strategy this was what was proposed by murdo fraser in the 2011 leadership election a a, a complete split from the uk party i think that what we're trying to do here so you're not splitting from the uk party because particularly you want to have more policy autonomy we might come on to later that the scottish conservatives dropped one of the most more interesting policies which was on tuition fees and they've run on manifestos in recent years that have tried to emphasize garnering lots of support rather than having interesting or distinctive policies. So what you're really doing here is you're trying to escape your association with the UK party. So I think it could be beneficial if it did manage to break that link with a more more unpopular UK party or a UK party that seemed out of touch with Scotland. But it would still, for at least the first uh, few years, be, be still associated with the former UK Conservative Party. So I, I think it, it w- you'd mainly be doing this in order to try to improve your image or break break your link with a party that had a worse image in Scotland. And I'm not entirely convinced that you'd be able to be, make such a, a clear break that it would put the Conservatives in, as a contender for government in Scotland. I, I, I think Andy's point is quite correct. I think Scottish politics is unusual insofar as the main centre-right challenger doesn't seem to be able to be in government. But I'm not sure that this change makes it any more likely necessarily 
that either that the other parties would acquiesce in uh, a conservative minority government in Scotland or, or indeed a conservative coalition government in Scotland. I think we should be clear, though, just on a couple of things, because they're quite important distinctions. So this is quite different from the Murdo Fraser proposition of 10 years ago, which obviously I was involved in. That was what you might compare to a kind of CSU, CDU model in Germany. That was a proposal that a new party would be created that would stand at Westminster and at Holyrood and would take the whip at Westminster. That's quite different to me because I think that that retains too much closeness to the UK Conservative Party and it makes it look like what it is, frankly, which is just changing the nameplate you know, on the same door. This is different. This is actually the creation of a party that would only stand for Holyrood and would have nothing to do with the UK Conservative Party. They would be un- completely unaligned. They would have no relationship to each other whatsoever. And the candidate for Dumfries and Galloway for Party X at the Scottish Parliament would have no relationship with the candidate for the Conservative Party in Dumfries and Galloway at Westminster. So it's quite a different system than the one that we proposed as part of the Murdo campaign. I think it's a much cleaner and better system. And ironically, it's one that actually people in London seem to like more. I think the other important thing, and again, this is from the Quebec experience. So I agree, if it was just seen to be some sort of successor party to the Conservative Party, that wouldn't be any good. I mean, I wouldn't have the word Conservative anywhere near the name of this party. And I'm not sure it would be a Conservative Party. I would I would imagine it would be more of a Federalist Party. Um, I think in the fullness of time, once you answer the constitutional question again, I, you know, I think we need a second referendum to do that. Um, but once you answer that sort of question, there are several figures from around Scottish politics and other parties that I would expect would be in a centre-right party, including many from the SNP, and even some from Labour, potentially would be part of a different party. But I agree, closer that party is seen to be to the legacy Conservative Party, the less chance there is of attracting new people to it, and therefore the less chance of it there is of it becoming a party of power. OK, let's turn our attention to recent developments. Normally easier for the territorial branches of statewide parties to be assertive when their party is in opposition at Westminster, but we saw Douglas Ross go out on a limb and call for the Prime Minister's resignation. I think the first senior Conservative figure in office to do so, and Ruth Davidson did so, I think, as well, uh, around the same time. But in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, no one seems to be talking about Partygate anymore. Even Keir Starmer has at least put on hold his calls for the Prime Minister to resign. So Boris Johnson seems safer in his post now than when Douglas Ross made that call. Is that a fair assessment? Do you think he is safer in position, Andy? I think it still matters what the full Grey report says, and I think it still matters what the Met say. And I think if those two different reports are particularly explosive, then he could undoubtedly still be in trouble. But I think we probably have to face a new reality, or at least a new potential reality, which is that Partygate is over. I think that is intensely frustrating for Keir Starmer and for Labour, and I completely understand why it would be. But the absolute reality is that if Europe is at war, uh, even if NATO territory hasn't been stepped on at that point, if the spectre of war sits over Europe, there is no way that Keir Starmer is going to call for Boris Johnson to go. And layered on top of that is that it does appear, if you look at is that Justin Trudeau is saying and br- other briefings that are coming out as well, it, Boris Johnson appears to be doing quite a good job uh, in terms of leading the way on things like closing down SWIFT, placing what Russia is doing in a historical context for leaders who are further away, for G7 leaders who are further away and don't perhaps have the same understanding. He appears to be doing quite well uh, at that. I think we have to probably face up to the fact that we could be entering a phase where he um, will be polling extremely highly again over the next few months. We'll know that soon enough with opinion polls and, of course, the test of the, the local elections to come. But what do you think, Alan, are the implications of him staying in power and potentially staying in power securely, both for the relationship uh, with the Scottish party and support for the party in Scotland? Is he a toxic figure, as he's often portrayed, a recruiting sergeant for independence? And where does it leave the relationship with his Scottish party leader? 
I think it's clear that he's not a popular figure in Scotland and also that the type of conservatism that Boris Johnson has been proposing has been unhelpful for the Scottish Conservative Party. So a much more solidly unionist style of approaching the constitution, so much more in tune with the kind of pre-1997 conservative attitudes about parliament being sovereign and overruling the, the Scottish parliament in some elements. I think the party in Scotland hasn't had a, a great relationship with Boris Johnson, so Douglas Ross had already resigned from Boris Johnson's government over a previous issue with uh, lockdown rules. And I think it makes it at the very least awkward for the Scottish Conservative Party to have um, a le its leader, who's, who clearly has a, is in dispute with the leader of the UK party. It's also not helpful when senior Conservatives refer to Douglas Ross as a, a lightweight figure as well. It's difficult to imagine that, that kind of comment happening under a previous Conservative leader at the UK level. So I think it's an awkward situation. And I think in, in many ways, any other of the potential credible candidates for the next leadership of the Conservative Party in that election would be better Boris Johnson in that respect. That charge of, of being a lightweight figure was uh, put in contrast to uh, Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack um, as being, I think it was Jacob Rees-Mogg who said the more important and the more relevant figure here. Andy, you said that was a it felt like a coordinated attack authorised by Downing Street. Is that still your feeling? And what does that tell us about the relationship between the UK party and its Scottish branch? Yeah, I think it definitely was a coordinated attack. Absolutely. I think he, because he, he had already said something earlier in the day on LBC, and then he used the lightweight comment on Newsnight that night, having been in a media operation in the political party before, if there was any concern whatsoever about his comments, he would have been pulled from the interview at night, um, or at least, the, or at the very least, told exactly what to say. So I, I mean, I'm fairly clear that was deliberate. What I think it did was I think it got to the heart of the psychological issue in the Conservative Party that actually acts as an umbrella over everything that we're discussing. Jacob Rees-Mogg doesn't think that Douglas Ross, the individual, is a lightweight. Jacob Rees-Mogg thinks that the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party is a lightweight. And he thinks that because, like a lot of Conservatives, he thinks that um, sovereignty and rule revolves around London and should revolve around London and should be exercised by London. They are not decentralists. They don't believe in it. They don't believe in decentralisation and they don't believe in devolution. And there will still be a very large number of people in the Conservative Party, if you ask them privately, including Scottish Conservatives members, if you ask them privately who don't believe in devolution and would rather it wasn't here and would abolish the Scottish Parliament. That is what the Jacob Rees-Smog school of thought is all about. They are centralising westminster orientated figures. And actually, that is the heart of everything. That's why creating more distance between the Tory party and the Scottish Tory party is an extremely difficult thing to do. That is why looking at a decentralised in constitutional structure like they have in Australia or the US or Canada or Spain or a whole number of places that you could mention is a very difficult thing to do because it's just extremely difficult to get these things past London. And to varying degrees, almost all UK Conservative leaders that I've been involved with or have known have thought this to varying degrees. Um, you know, George Osborne was slightly more decentralist than David Cameron, who was quite centralist. Um, it wasn't even on the radar for people like Michael Howard or Ian Duncan Smith. Theresa May was very centralist, very Westminster orientated. Boris Johnson can be persuaded on these things. And I think, you know, he could probably see more of a, a sort of live and let live argument. But, you know, those around him, like Jacob Rees-Mogg, are just not, not at the races in that respect. Even people who are seen as being fairly radical and fairly decentralist when it comes to, for example, giving power uh, to the North, like Michael Gove, for instance, who's obviously behind the levelling up agenda and very keen on, on the Northern powerhouse, have a psychological issue, I think, when it comes to devolving more power to the nations of the UK, not just Scotland, but to Wales and Northern Ireland as well. This is in the Tory party's DNA. And this is why ultimately, whenever I'm asked about this, I just truthfully say that I don't think these things that I've been talking about for 15 years, like a new party and so on, I ultimately don't think they will happen because I simply don't think it's in the DNA of this party to decentralise. 
what Jacob Rees-Mogg did was just simply bring that out into the open because a lot of other people think the same thing. Alan, you talked about this a little bit in your in your book where you talked about the Central Conservative Party um, subscribing to an idea of unionism that places central autonomy at its heart, so particularly in the context of preserving parliamentary sovereignty. Are we seeing that in spades now? I'm thinking in particular of setting aside the Sewell Convention when the Scottish Parliament and the Senate have withheld their consent. Do you share that view that Andy was articulating there about the UK party perhaps being more open maybe um, about its its scepticism of, of devolution? Yeah, I think Andy's right that there's a, a latent gene in the Conservative Party which really believes in parliamentary sovereignty. And we've seen when push comes to shove, it will assert that sovereignty. Where I'd maybe depart from Andy is that I think the problem is not in decentralising power necessarily. The Conservative Party under David Cameron is actually quite good at decentralising power. You have the, the two Scotland Acts where they give more power to Scotland and there's also equivalents in Wales as well. So I think the party is actually quite good at giving away power. And I think David Cameron was, to that extent, one of those leaders who did believe in that. The problem, I think, comes, it's not about, in in the federalism literature, you talk about self-rule and shared rule. So I think that the the Conservative Party has, by and large, not had a problem with self-rule in terms of devolving power to Scotland or Wales, sometimes referred to as devolve and forget. So they're, by and large, not bothered about policy divergence and health or education or other issues. I think the problem comes when devolved issues impinge on parliamentary sovereignty sovereignty at the centre. I think this has been the big problem for the Conservatives, this idea of shared rule. So what do you do with big issues that have to be decided at a central level, but which also involve the devolved governments? And I think this has been the big problem, and this will be the big problem, as Andy's already alluded to, that what, what, perhaps why we won't get federalism in the UK, is this reluctance to have formalised devolved input in central decision making. So I think the challenge for the Conservative Party is not so much decentralisation, which I think actually, in terms of Scotland and Wales, they can do. The problem is thinking about how do we involve Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in decisions at the centre. I do think that if we look at the two devolutions under David Cameron, the two Scotland Acts under Cameron, which is effectively the Calman Commission and then the Smith Commission, those are both highly reactive events. The Calman Commission has a reaction to the SNP for the first time becoming the government, government of Scotland after 2007 election. The Smith Commission is a very acute reaction to almost losing the first independence referendum. These are not examples, I don't think, of a political party which is proactively trying to lead people. It's an example of a political party which is being led and being dragged into events, much like they were dragged into devolution itself and took a long time to accept it. That's really interesting, Andy, but you can be dragged with a willingness to accommodate or you can compete. And are we not seeing something a bit different now, in addition to what Alan was talking about in terms of a reluctance to share power, um, perhaps over some of those issues that might be reserved but have an impact on devolved issues? Are we not seeing something a bit more like competition in the devolved space itself? So show central authority, including sometimes in areas that are devolved. Absolutely. And I think it's a reflection of what, in my view, certainly from a from both a professional perspective, because obviously my day job is a, as a lobbyist and I see this a lot, and, and from a political perspective, I think is by some distance the best and most active and most strategic Scotland office that we have seen since devolution. The Alistair Jack Scotland office is a very, very good machine between Alistair Jack and Ian Stewart and... Malcolm Offord, Lord Offord at ministerial level, and also the choice of advisors that they have sitting underneath them. This is a very smart and strategic Scotland office, which is behaving entirely differently from Scotland offices of the past, and is also exploiting an increasingly tired Scottish government, almost reversing roles where five years ago the Scotland office was sluggish and slow, and the Scottish government was nimble and ready. It's almost a role reversal at this point now. Uh, And I think the Scotland office are understanding that if they, and this is down to Gove in part as well, I think it's fair to say down to Michael Gove in part, I think they are understanding that actions speak louder than words. Uh, And if they simply get themselves involved, for example, in funding some projects, in direct funding to local authorities, 
in areas which are devolved, but which clearly need assistance, whether it be you know building a bridge or or doing whatever. I think their calculation is that the SNP might call it an attack on devolution, but that on the ground, people will just say, thanks very much, we needed that, um, and they won't really care where the money comes from. Alan, what what do you think this strategy is for the union beyond opposition, not just to independence, but to an independence referendum? I think uh, wait and see. So I think um, wait and see if something turns up. So potentially Nicola Sturgeon won't be the leader of the Scottish National Party or First Minister at the next elections in Scotland. Support for an independence referendum might have gone down by then. Is there some opportunity for the SNP to seem weakened by then? So I think the strategy is to wait and see if something turns up. But in the meantime, through the Scottish office and through other ways, try to show the union working in a slightly different way. I think if they wanted to be more strategic about it, I I think they need to think about this idea of shared rule at the centre. So I think they need to start thinking about what is acceptable to to, to Conservatives who believe in parliamentary sovereignty. So in that, I think they could look at the the recent Dunlop review of um, the structure of government at the centre. So some of Dunlop's recommendations have been implemented by the UK government, but others haven't. And Gove is now in charge of the of the union at central government. But I think they need to start, if it's not to be this kind of reactive um, being dragged along, as, as, as Andy re- refers to it, I think that's where they need to do some of the thinking. So what does, you know, the Conservatives often talk like um, they're not in charge or devolution is this thing that's being done to them um, without actually re- acknowledging the fact that they, they are in charge and they could legislate on this issue or they could change the structures in this issue. So I think we need to think about what what does devolution look like? If, if the current setup in devolution um, we don't think works particularly well and you often hear them refer to Blair's devolution and other things, well, the onus is then on you to say, well, what does devolution in the UK look like when it's designed by a Conservative? And if you want devolution to last and it to be a durable structure um, and a structure in which Conservatives can be successful, um, then I think they need to start thinking about these strategic questions of what what type of setup then would we design and can we give some, even at the most basic level, I mean, Dunlop is not a radical report, so even at the most basic level, can we bring ourselves to implement this? And if they can't bring themselves to implement that or think more deeply about it, then I think they will be struck, stuck in this reactive mode. Coming back to the party's fortunes within the Scottish Parliament, There was a fascinating word cloud analysis that the Scottish election study team uh, put together that showed that very few Conservative voters were motivated to vote Tory by the party's policies or its leaders. Instead, overwhelmingly, a vote for the Conservatives and indeed for Labour and Lib Dems was a vote against the SNP and independence. And you saw that in, in the Conservatives election campaign. It was about stopping the SNP getting majority, stopping a referendum. And it's not clear, certainly not clear to voters, what the party was for. That's a problem, isn't it? If the party aspires to be more than a feisty opposition in Parliament? Yes, it is. I'm not clear what it's for either. I'm not aware it's for anything. Every campaign since 2014, 2015 was not a successful campaign, but 2016 was, 2017 was, 2021 was, and 2019 was okay, a bit of a reversal, but it was acceptable but they've all been the same campaign. They've all been single-issue campaigns based on saying no to Indy Ref 2. Um, There's very little else that sits behind it. The reaction to those campaigns was a bit different. I felt there was a different reaction to the most recent one, the 2021 election. I think the internal private reaction was different. A lot of Tory MSPs immediately said to me, you know, enough's enough. We've got to actually start to say something. We've got to be for something now. Uh, okay, it was a good result. We held on to all our seats and that's all fine, but but we've got to be for something now. My concern for them is that I think when an election comes along uh, and it's again framed by the Constitution, which every election will be until we have another referendum, it's again framed by the Constitution, they will have really no option politically, psychologically, emotionally. They'll have no option but just to revert back to the same campaign. So when we have another general election in maybe it's the end of 2023 or whenever it is uh, likely to be, I expect to see the exact same campaign. There are always different slants on the campaign. You know, we can't do this now because 
of Ukraine, for instance. We can't do it because of dependence on this or dependence on that. You know, the, the slants are always different. They'll pick up on a current event to create another argument why we can't do this just now. But the campaign is always the same. It's always no to indie ref too, and it will be again. Alan, you have the last word. I think that's correct, but it's, it's not been an unsuccessful strategy in terms of picking up um, those unionist voters. So we know that the Conservatives increased support from those who were no and Brexit um, between 2015 and 17, and they've managed to pick up, you know, voters beyond what they had before because of their focus on the, the union. I agree that um, they followed uh, Linton Crosby's advice, I think, where he says, you know, get the barnacles off the boat. There is nothing remotely controversial in the Scottish Conservative Party manifestos anymore, which does give rise to this idea of what is it for. But again, if you have no prospect of being in government at the next election, there isn't really an incentive to put forward lots of interesting policies um, that you want to implement or interesting ideas about the machinery of government in Scotland. So I think the incentive structure for the Scottish Conservatives remains to try and pick up as many unionist votes as possible. And until there's a a prospect of government, until the constitutional question goes away, I don't think that's an entirely irrational strategy. Fascinating discussion, and no doubt we will continue it in the months and years to come. Thank you both for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in to this episode. You've been listening to Constitutionally Sound from the Centre on Constitutional Change with me, Nicola McEwan, Alan Convery, Senior Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and author of the Territorial Conservative Party, and Andy McKeever, Political Analyst, Strategist and Commentator, and Founder of Lobbying and PR Consultancy, Message Matters. Speak to you next time. Thank you.